machine learning discovery and biological responses. I'd like to thank our session chair for being the first person in my life to correctly the first time guess how to pronounce my name. <laughs> So a critical problem in systems biology is to characterize the effects of perturbations on a system. For this, we have essentially two approaches. We can either build mechanistic models or phenomenological models. And for the latter, our efforts revolve around knowing what the phenotype of experiments are. Now to do this, we have a learning problem. And the most direct way to try and learn these systems is to perform as many experiments as you can, to try to do them all. Now, clearly, that's not always possible. There are cases where the experiment space is just way too huge. So a refinement to this is to try and select upfront meaningful experiments perform. And this requires that you have some form of prior knowledge about the targets or conditions that lets you subselect. Once you've settled on what the experiment space is that you're going to try and learn in, we have a couple of additional tasks. The first is choosing the number of experiments we perform at a time, and then critically, what experiments are performed in a set. So every time we perform some experiment, we may do one or many, and the question is, which ones do we do at a time? Again, we have a dichotomy. We can either just try and optimize some global property of the data we will collect, such as for random sampling, or we can attempt to make use of model predictions as we progress through. So we collect some data, and with predictions of model of these, we can attempt to choose the next experiments. And these fall largely into these two kinds of categories, methods like quantitative structure activity relationships and active learning paradigms. These, when applied to a many target system, have a few challenges. So, as an example, imagine, so, uh, in, in, you know, so in this form here, we have going across rows, different targets of a system we're interested in, and going across columns, different drugs or perturbations that we could apply to that system, and the whole is our experiment space. So if we wanted to try and learn a mini target system, the uh, one very natural application of existing methods is to try and consider each target in parallel. And what this means is we would collect data, say, for this one protein on its own, and then these red circles are the unmeasured combinations from which we would make predictions, or for which, rather, we would make predictions. And we would do this separately for the other proteins that we could do. Now, the problem is it's not obvious how to take models that we would learn for individual targets and apply them to wholly different targets or possibly new conditions. So the alternative to these sorts of approaches is to try and perform experiments on all the targets and all of the conditions in some sparse way. Now, once we've collected these data in order to get a predictive model, the, the, uh, the approaches in general are to treat these data as a sparse matrix factorization problem. And this is, of course, a very well-studied scenario. Now, the problem here is this, or the, you know, the, the challenge is this. All of the methods that we just looked at are based on having estimates of similarity. That is a prior knowledge of how to compare among different, say, drugs and different targets. That way I can have some way of making predictions from one to the others. Now, the challenge is it's not clear what we do when we have no such prior knowledge or we can't obviously compare, say, among the conditions or among the targets. There's not an obvious way of doing that. And secondly, what do we do when our features, when the readouts that we have are not unidimensional, as in the matrix factorization problem or the other cases we considered, but high dimensional or extraordinarily noisy or categorical. So a canonical example of, the, of this challenge is image-based screening. So in image-based screening, I would observe, for instance, the localization of some fluorescent reporter in the cell, say protein K tagged with GFP, under some drug. 
these data are naturally high dimensional. And the general way we'd, re the general way we'd represent them is in some very high dimensional feature space. So our proposed solution is to treat this in two steps. First, to build a grouped clustering for the experiment space. This gives us a predictive model. And then with these predictions, we can build an active learning algorithm for this problem, or for these problems, rather. So again, returning to the image-based screening example, let's suppose that I've collected, as the inductive step, already several experiments worth of data. And again, these data are very high dimensional. I'm just showing here in this cartoon two dimensions of this feature space. And what we do is we first cluster these to find or to identify what the phenotypes are so far. Coming back to the experiment space, so we have phenotypes for the observed experiments. And now the question is, how do we form predictions for unmeasured combinations of drugs and proteins in this case. The way, one way we can do this is to identify, as a starting point here, proteins with similar responses to drugs. So here I'm showing you one factor in blue. All three of these proteins we could consider to be the same factor because everywhere they've been co-observed under the same drug, we saw the same phenotype. So all the way on the left-hand side, these three proteins had a, what, you know, this red phenotype in this cartoon, yeah? We can perform, and so, and, you know, do, repeating this process across all the proteins allows us to identify every protein, in this case, with a different factor. And the number of factors is less than or equal to the number of proteins. We can do exactly the same thing for drugs. What this gives us is a factorization of essentially this matrix without relying on any sort of prior knowledge, without relying on the ability to compare among the drugs or proteins. We're doing that through the data we've observed. Now, to make a predictive model, what we're going to do is say, well, look, in the case of these, this blue factor, the cases that we haven't actually performed, we simply impute or predict to be what that factor would say it is. All of these together give us the predictive model we need to handle the case for high dimensional or categorical phenotypes. The next question is how do we, how do we build up an active learner for these? So we have this model and what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to exploit the structure of these similarities and the predictions that we've made. So imagine now if I perform the outline in black circle experiments, so Try and highlight this here, right? If I perform this pair of experiments in my next round of experimentation, and it turns out, well, so for these two experiments, I have currently predicted the same phenotype. If it turns out after having performed those experiments that in fact they differ, I've learned something. I now know that there is a dis that these are not all the same factor for the protein. Yeah. Performing a very large combinatorial optimization over all the possible choices we could make and their outcomes allows us to choose, suppose your, your batch was, you say, 50 experiments. It allows you to choose the most informative batch of 50 experiments to perform at the same time. Okay? So what we have now is we have a grouped clustering of experiments where the experiments are necessarily extraordinarily sparse because they're very large experiment space. And we have an active learning method that allows us to explore it. So to characterize this active learner, and also because we need a parameterization of these sorts of problems in order to understand what's going on, we need something analogous to what we do for linear systems. So for a matrix factorization problem, we can say, ah, here is the rank of the true data. And that is the characterization of the data. It's not known or it's not obvious what you should do for a categorical, categorical system. So we've proposed a parameterization of categorical experiment spaces, and they have the following three parameters. Uniqueness, how many factors are there? So this is analogous to rank for matrix factorization problems. How responsive were the targets to the conditions? That is, how often do they, do they change from a no drug or a vehicle or a nominal state? and the total number of phenotypes 
you have in the system. Now we can use this parameterization to characterize the active learner in the following way. We generated a lot of synthetic experiments in an ex synthetic experiment spaces. And we varied uniqueness and, and responsiveness parameters over a very broad range. Uh, and, and, and also the number of phenotypes we considered. For each one of these systems separately, we ran the active learner in batch sizes were 1% of the experiment space. And we also ran a random learner where it just blindly sampled and still built a model using our model. And we asked how much better was the active learner than the random learner at achieving 100% accuracy models. So on the x-axis here are the responsivenesses of these models, these simulated systems, and on the y-axis, the uniqueness of these systems. And so for each cell, we had the average of many different simulations for that combination of uniqueness and responsiveness. Warmer colors are better, and the colors indicate what fraction of the experiment space was saved by the active learner to achieve 100% accuracy over what a random learner would have needed to do. And so the key takeaways here are, there are no regrets from active learning with this model. You never do worse, and in general, there's a good improvement over random learning. So that's all well and good that you can have a model that in principle, if you kept performing experiments, would give you a very accurate model, but that's not enough. The next challenge is to know how much you should do when can I stop experimenting? I would like to not spend any more money, let's say, or resources than I actually have to. To do this, you need a way of answering the question, how accurate is my model without having to collect or know the ground truth? Now, again, there's some obvious ways to approach this problem. The, the, the simplest is simply just to do as many as you can do and then stop and then hope that you had a good model. Um, the refinement to this in our proposed solution is to attempt to estimate a model that lets you predict or estimate the accuracy of an actively learned model. And the way we did this was we sampled, again, a great number of cases across our parameterization. So we varied uniqueness, we varied responsivenesses, we varied the number of phenotypes. And we, for each of these simulated cases, performed active learning. We took these mo actively learned models and measured many different properties about them. Collecting these gave us a design matrix for regression. So what we did is we regressed these various properties of the observed models against the measured accuracy, which we were able to do because these are simulated data and we actually know the ground truth. So the results of this are Along the x-axis here, we have the predicted accuracy score. So what is the output of the regression model that we learned for a new case where we don't have ground truth? On the y-axis is the probability that if you had, if the regression tells you, for instance, that the model is 80% accurate, what's the probability that the true model, or that, sorry, your true accuracy is at least 80%. So for high accuracy cases, 80% and above, we're able to accurately predict when you have sufficiently, when you've performed sufficiently many experiments. And, and so we can reliably estimate in the most important case here, right, which is when I have an accurate model, I know that I can stop because I can measure something with just what I have that, that is the data I've already collected, and decide, ah, yes, I have, say, an 85% accurate model, I'm done. Now, we took this model and in the simulation that we've built and characterized through simulations and asked, well, how do we actually, can we, can we use this in real life, right? In simulation, with simulated data, rather, phenotypes are easily distinguished, right? The noise model is very simple. In real life, we have very noisy phenotypes, and phenotype identification is itself a challenging problem. And so we asked, can we learn, can we apply this method to learn the effects of many different drugs on different protein subcellular localizations? So we've previously described a collection of CD-tagged clones 
that each ex endogenously express a GFP uh, tagged protein in NIH3T3. We built a library of 40 of these clones, and they vary over different subcellular compartments. And we asked, if I built, again, a library of 48 drugs, what is the effect of each of these drugs on each of the protein localizations? Now, we don't actually know ahead of time what the right answer should be, right? So in order to give us a way of saying, is the model actually learning when two proteins are the same or when two drugs are the same, we introduced a silent duplication as follows. We silently duplicated the drugs. So from 48, we now have 96 drugs. And likewise, we presented 96 proteins to the learner. This gives us an experiment space of 96 proteins and 96 drugs. We started the process by collecting images of all of these 96 proteins given to the learner under a no drug case. The active learner, again, it chose, so we, the active learner was proceeding in rounds of 96 experiments, or 1% of the experiment space at a time. We actively sampled 30 batches worth of experiments, and this corresponds to 28% of this 96 by 96 space, okay? That also corresponded to having covered 72% of the unique combinations of the 48 proteins and 48 drugs. Now, in order, to get, in order to obtain a complete data set, we went and filled in those unique, combina the unique combinations of protein and drug that had not yet been performed by the learner. Now we can ask the question, how accurate were the predictions of the model for unmeasured experiments? Right? The proof of the pudding. So in black here, going across on the x-axis, how much of the experiment space had been covered in the 96 by 96 experiment space, the active learner's accuracy. So you notice that early models emphasized ultimately incorrect correlations, but then the learner was able to very rapidly identify correct correlations in the data and pick efficiently among these experiments. Now, to quantify this a bit, an ideal sampling, because we have this duplication structure, would be to perform say, all of the experiments in the upper left-hand corner, the, the unique 48 by 48, and then in order to be able to tell which drugs are the same, you could do a diagonal, and in order to be able to tell which proteins are the same, you would do another diagonal, okay? So it'd be 48 times 48 plus two times 48 experiments, and that's going to be roughly 26% of the total experiment space. What we can do is we can ask, how well did our active learner do in comparison by producing a coverage model of how often each experiment was actually selected by the learner at every stage. So for instance, we can count how many of the unique 48 by 48 experiments were not covered at all, how many were covered once, twice, three times, up to four times. With these, we can build a linear regression which relates how much we covered any one kind of experiment with the accuracy we observed. This gives us this blue line here. So we can see that qualitatively, we're able to model the effectiveness of active learning in recovering this duplication structure. Now let's look at the loadings for a moment here. So the vector on the very left, these are the loadings. So for instance, there are 0 0.42 units of accuracy you get by not even performing an experiment at all. Right? This indicates that there's some additional duplications among the proteins and drugs beyond the ones that we induced by duplicating drugs and proteins. There's additional replication. We get one unit of accuracy by performing experiment once. You have an enormous penalty for performing experiment four times. You're very heavily penalized for wasting experiment budget, in essence, on doing too many of the same thing. Now, this matrix in the middle, I'm showing you what the values were, what our coverage was at the final model, the 30th model of active learning. So you see that we had 28% of the experiments not covered at all, and 38% of the experiments covered once, and this is the largest number. So this, and, and you notice that we covered 
less than 1% four times. So the active learner was very efficient at figuring out what the structure of the space is with greatly varying phenotypes and very noisy phenotypes. I just want to point out that for the ideal case I just mentioned, the numbers you should expect would be you would cover experiments once 98% of the time, and then 2% of the experiments you have to cover twice for you to figure out what the duplications are. Using that coverage model, the blue model, we can ask, well, what would we have seen had we done random sampling? And that's our proxy to actually having performed random sampling, which we did not do because that would have required us to physically do a separate thread of experiments, and that would have been uh, cost prohibitive. And so what we see here is a 40% improvement by the active learner over random sampling, even with these extraordinarily noisy phenotypes. So to summarize, we've constructed a model that's capable of learning sparse and missing value problems where the readouts are categorical or high dimensional. In the high-dimensional case, we reduce this to a categorical phenotype problem by clustering. We've also identified a parameterization of these, of these sorts of problems, which lets us measure the difficulty of these problems. And we developed and characterized the accuracy of a stopping role, so we know when to stop, which is crucial. It's not simply enough to say, I have an active learner, let me just try and do as many experiments and hope that I have a good accuracy, we have a way of saying, here's the accuracy that we can estimate of the model and our confidence in that prediction. Thanks. So, fascinating stuff. Thank you. Uh, We've been thinking about similar things, so. Good. Yeah. I mean, it's a fun problem, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so in this particular application scenario, right, you're, the, app, the experiments are homogeneous, as in you're doing the same experiments to fill in every cell of the matrix. What if you are not doing the same experiment, but you're on an exploratory path where you may be doing one experiment now and may need to do a follow-up different, completely different kind of experiment. That's a, that's a, that's a great question. So let, let me rephrase this slightly. Okay. Imagine that as you perform these experiments, you change what the readout is, right? Is, is that a way of rephrasing what you just said? You, you're changing what you're measuring. Yeah, yes. Yeah, and so, uh, so that's, a, that's, a very, that's a very interesting case. You'd have to have some way of comparing them, right? You'd, I mean, ultimately this method relies on your ability so we don't have prior information about the conditions or the targets. What you need now is you need a way of comparing phenotypes, right? So if you can find a way, it doesn't have to be the clustering, the pre-clustering approach you described. If you have a way of taking the data from two different experiments and say, are they the same or are they different? Then that would suffice for you to apply this method. But you know, the, that's a fascinating angle to take, to take this line on. Thanks. And if I can ask another one. Please. So would the same method work for, let's say, Mark Vidal's experiments to fill in the whole protein interaction matrix? I I'm sorry, could you, could you repeat? So, so Mark Vidal at Harvard is running this massive oh, yes, project yes, to okay. fill in the N by N protein interaction matrix, right? Uh, so will the same method work for that experiment as well? So uh, the protein-protein interaction matrix, I mean, so let's think of what the condition is, right? So the condition is, um, you know, will these pair of proteins, well, so the, the readouts are, do these pair of proteins interact? Yeah, so that looks like a very long protein on one axis and protein on the other axis in the middle diagonal you already filled in, yeah? Yeah. Uh, so you could, it's challenging though because the readout is essentially just binary. Yes, did they interact or not? And so that, you know, there, we, we have, we have in, our, in our paper, we actually do apply it to the binary case for you know, some genomics data and show that we were still able to, uh, that this model is, is able to learn efficiently in that case. But I, I, you know, there's always going to be room for more specialized methods for those sorts of cases. Okay. 